Welcome! You've reached Programming on Purpose with Python. This is the third in our series of slides, shells, and in this one we are going to develop a passer rating calculator. My name is Mike Callahan and I am a STEM educator. So what we're going to do first of all is look at how the NFL calculates the passer rating. We're going to look at the math involved and then we're going to develop a passer function that does the very same thing. Our first version is going to be what I call a brute force method and then we're going to see how to improve our function and we're going to learn about something called refractoring and we're also going to learn about iterative loops and list comprehensions. And then at the end, we'll talk about what our next step is going to be. The conventions used in this and other slides will be code will always be in a model spaced text and new code will be highlighted in yellow. Objects will be in a bold rounded text and any new words I introduce will be in italics. So here is our passer rating function. We want to create an application that will calculate the NFL's passer rating. So the first step we got to do is create a function that will do the math. We need five parameters. It's completed passes, attempted passes, total yards completed, touchdowns thrown, and interceptions thrown. And it turns out the math is not as simple as you would think. Passer rating was developed and it's used by the NFL and it ranges between 0 and 158.3. The average is around 89. There have been eight quarterbacks that have hit the highest rating more than once and Lamar Jackson did it twice this year. There also have been some quarterbacks that hit 0 during a game and it turns out that the quarterback with the higher passer rating most of the time will be the winning team in a game. So here's the math involved. We calculate four terms. The terms are then limited by zero as a minimum, so that means no negative terms, and two point 375 as a maximum. These terms are then added together, divided by 6, not 4, but 6, and then multiplied by 100. So our variables are going to be comp, which is the number of completed passes, ATT, the number of attempted passes, yards, the total number of yards, TD, the total number of touchdowns thrown, INTC, the number of interceptions thrown, and rating, the passer rating. Now, why didn't we use INT for interceptions? Well, I want you to do this in your shell uh, window of idle. I want you to type in INT and hit enter and you'll see that Python tells you INT is a class. It's a built-in class. So if we want to convert any object into an integer, all we have to do is type in the object in parentheses with the INT call and it'll convert it to an integer. Now it is possible to say I want to use int as a variable. You can see that we did that. We said int equals 1. And indeed, int now contains 1. However, if we try to call int with its function, you can see that we have destroyed that feature. Now, this is in Python is called overriding. And overriding is a very important part of the language. And it is very useful. But we don't want to use that here. 
So if you accidentally ever overwrite a, a variable uh, that happens to be a class, it's very easy to fix the problem. All you have to do is type DEL space INT and hit enter, and now everything is back to the way it should be. So now that's why we're going to use INTC rather than INT. So if you're ever working in the shell and you type a variable name and it comes out purple, pick a different name. So a quick review of how you do decisions in Python, you say if, and then some condition, and the condition has to be evaluated as true or false with a colon. Then your block of code, remember in Python, blocks of code are indented, four spaces. And then you may have an optional if else with another condition, and you can have as many of those as you want to. And finally, your default would just be an else. And don't forget that colon, that's the number one error. So here, as you can see below, what we're going to do with our terms here, if A is less than 0.0, .0 remember we're using floating point values, so that's the reason why we want floating point constants. If A is less than 0.0, .0 colon, A equals 0.0. .0. So that is going to make sure that we don't have any negative numbers. Else if A is greater than 2.375, colon, then A equals 2.375, and that will be our upper limit. So here is our actual code. You can see for A, it's going to be equal to parens completed passes divided by attempted passes and then minus 0 0.3. And then that whole thing multiplied times 5.0. You can see we're duplicating exactly what the formula is. We don't need parentheses around completed divided by attempted passes because remember division has a higher priority than subtraction. Then we do the same thing for yards compared to completed passes but with different constants. Then the C term is touchdowns divided by attempts times 20. You can see that uh, touchdowns really are, are heavily weighted to increase your uh, rating. And then interceptions, uh, you can see, is a negative. And it's even heavier weighted. Then we're going to check each term. That's what that decision we developed on the previous slide was all about. And then our final calculation at the end, rating equals A plus B plus C plus D, all that's in parentheses, divided by 6, multiplied times 100. And so that should give us our passer rating. Let's review Python comments again. A pound symbol means ignore the rest of the line. And this is a great place to put uh, just a one-line comment at the end of a line of code, especially if you're doing something a little unusual. The triple double quotes means ignore everything until you find to the next triple double quote. So it's a great way of commenting sections of code. And you can also use triple single quotes. A review of what Boolean is. A Boolean is a variable that is either true or false. And in Python, true is one and false is zero. All objects with the value of zero or empty are logically false. So zero is false, an empty list, an empty tuple, an empty dictionary, and an empty string are all false. And none is that special value, which is also false. Everything else is true. And you will see this is useful for writing easy to read code. We also have operators that work on Booleans. They are or, and you just write out the word or. And if or is true, if either x or y 
is true. Now notice if x is true, then it's really not important what y is, whether it's true or false, the or is still going to make it true. So y is not even evaluated. And that is called a short circuit. And it can actually speed up execution in programs. But you have to make sure that you don't want y to be evaluated or you have to require that y is evaluated. And is similar, it's true only if x and y are true. And if x is false, then y is not evaluated. And we have that short circuit. And not, just write out NOT, it just reverses a Boolean variable. If you say not x, then if it was false, it will be true and vice versa. We have some comparison operators as well. We have less than, just what you would think it would be, and less than or equal, exactly just what you would think it would be, greater than, greater than or equal. And equal, notice it is a double equal sign. This is to keep it from being confused with a single equal sign, which is actually an assignment operator. Not equal is an exclamation point and an equal sign. Uh, a lot of times, a vertical line means not. And is is interesting. If you have two objects, if they happen to be the same object, the same memory location, then you can say something like, if A is B, and then uh, you can make some kind of decision. One of the nice things about the comparison operators in Python is you can chain them. So if you want to see if x is equal to or greater than 0 but less than 10, you can just write it out exactly the way you would think you would. So we've talked about all three of these things. Let's review. An operator takes one or two objects, it does something, and returns a new object. An example here of a plus b, and uh, that could be an addition, or x greater than 0, that would be a logical uh, decision. Functions take one or more objects, do something, and return a new object. But functions are not bound to anything. They just can float out there and can handle all kinds of different objects. An example is if we want to convert the string 45 to an integer, we would call the integer function. And we've already written a couple of functions before. One of the ones that we have in our previous example was main. And uh, that's an example of a function with no arguments. And methods are bound to an object using a period. They might use another object as an argument. They do something, and then they might return a new object. And so an example is we have a string called title, and we want to convert that to uppercase. You would just say title.upper, an empty argument list. And then we've already seen how to do this with our uh, TK enter toy library. We're adding an entry example here on a, on a GUI window. We'd say GUI dot add entry and our arguments are tagged in a prompt. So let's create our passer rating function. So we're going to go into idle and we're going to create a new file and we're going to call it passer.py and we're going to add these lines. Now remember the first line of any file probably should be some sort of documentation line. And Sarah, I, I always say the minimum documentation line should be the name of the function or the name of the file, what it does, who wrote it, and when you, when you last wrote it. So that is the minimum, and we have it in there. Most of the time, if you're writing a, a more complicated application, you would want to have a lot more stuff there. And then we're going to have our function definition. We're going to say def, passer rating. And again, I like to use camel case for my function names. And then all the arguments we need. 
uh, or actually parameters we need in this case will be comp, ATT, yards, TD, and INTC. Close that parentheses and don't forget the colon. Next, we're going to write the code we developed for calculating the terms for A, B, C, and D. And again, be careful with how your parentheses line up. Um, as you're typing, idle will actually help you. Uh, when you cl close a parentheses, it will show you very briefly what the matching parentheses is. This keeps you kind of on track. And we're going to filter our first term. It's that decision we developed earlier. If a is less than 0, then a equals 0. Else if a is greater than 2.375, colon, a equals 2.375. Notice that we have to indent the block of code that is under the if and the else if. So after you've done that with A, here's a great chance to use your copy-paste technique. You can just copy and paste it, repeat it, and do it for B, C, and D. Next, once we have all our terms, we're going to assign that to rating equals the quantity A, B, C, and D. Added together, divided by 6, multiplied times 100, and last line in our function is return space rating. Notice that everything under that function must be indented for spaces. That is how Python marks blocks of code. So after we have created our function, we have to test it. Now notice we're going to use a print statement for that. We say print parens passer rating and here's where we're going to be calling our function. We're going to use 30 completed passes out of 40 attempted passes, 300 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. And we have to have two closing parentheses. The first one closes the function call. The second one closes the print function. And notice this print function is not indented. That's very important because if we were to indent this thing, it would be part of the passer rating function. This is not. It's not part of the function. It is a test of the function. Therefore, it must not be indented. And we run our module, and we can see that the result will be in the shell window. And we have 110.416666 goes on to uh, the limit of what the screen is there. Um, and so you, we can see that our passer rating function is working. If you get a different number, then you need to look at your code. More than likely, you have some parentheses out of place. Now our code works, and 110 would be a good game for a quarterback, but you can see that, uh, first of all, we need to round things. So usually quarterback ratings are reported to the nearest tenth. And the filtering section, it just looks bad. It's, it's kind of wordy, and it, it just doesn't look like it's good use of our coding ability. There's got to be a better way. And of course, with Python, there is. Notice the filtering section is the same, except for a variable change. So this would be a great place for a helper function that would do the filtering. Whenever you pull out redundant code and place it into its own function, that is called refactoring. And so we're going to refactor that filter with a new function, which we're going to call filter term. 
and you can see the filtering looks just like what we developed except for instead of a b c d we replace that with the variable term which will be a parameter for our new function and we're going to add this function before passer rating let's do that on the next slide so you can see we took the tests that were in passer rating and we just moved it up into filter term we changed the letter a to the word term that's going to be our parameter and so when we do this all we have to do is add a return term notice that that test is indented underneath the function and for each level of the if and the else if that is also indented I can't stress how important indentation is in Python. It is absolutely critical that you get the indentation correctly. Now down in passer rating, all that code that had the tests for A, B, C, and D, we just replaced them with calls to filter term uh, for the A argument and then the B, C, D. And uh, last, we return a rounding call for rating to the nearest tenth of a digit. So we make these changes, we save them, and we'll test to see how it works out. So now we're going to test our new code again, and we can see, ah, it's working. Uh, we got a nice rounded to 110.4, and uh, we didn't come up with a different number, which is very encouraging. So that shows that our code is working. We're still not completely pleased because we have filter term called four times and the only thing that happens is we've had a change in the argument. Now that required four lines of code and so four lines of code is not a big deal. But what if we had a section of code that we had to call a hundred times? You certainly don't want to have to write a hundred lines of the same code with just a change of arguments. So Python has a nice little feature, which is called an iterative loop. And we'll see how that works. We've already talked about conditional loops. This is an iterative loop. And so it uses a different word. It uses for. And then you have a variable that is called an iterator. And an iterator just basically keeps track of things. And then you say n, and in some kind of collection, it can be a sequence, it can be a dictionary, it can be lots of different things. And don't forget that colon. Then you have your block of code that will be executed. And then you also have the else clause, which is very similar to what was doing in the conditional loops. The nice thing is the iterator keeps count for you. So you don't have to worry about if something is getting near the end. And again, you can use it for sequences, maps, files, and you exit the loops using break. You continue the loops using continue, and the else part of the loop will only execute if the loop does not break. So here is the two lines of code we're going to use to replace four lines of code. For term, n, and we've created a list. It could have also been a tuple of a. B, C, and D. We're kind of taking these terms and sticking them into some sort of a sequence. And then you can see we are using calling filter term and we're sticking it back into term. So again, our four lines of code are being replaced by two lines of code. But notice if we could, as long as we have that list there, A, B, C, it could be D, E, F, G. We still only need two lines of code. And that is the beauty of using an iterative loop. And as this thing is executing, term, which is our iterator, will be replaced by A, then B, then C, then D. And everything will be taken care of for us automatically. Iterative loops are really a powerful part of Python.
we test our function again and we get the same number so again that makes us feel good no we used a loop to process a list now this happens so frequently in Python that they developed a one-line shortcut called a list comprehension while it looks a little strange it is actually very useful it combines loops decisions lists and assignments and it looks like this you have some list variable equals a bracket some kind of variable statement that will be executed and then our for loop for iter and collection and then you also have an optional condition so for our example we're going to replace our two lines of code with this one line terms equals bracket filter term of term or term in a b c and d double bracket the first bracket closes the list the second bracket closes the list comprehension so what we're going to do is we're going to test how list comprehension works in the shell window so we have to introduce a couple of new functions chr will convert an integer into an ascii character so if i call chr with 65 it will generate the letter a range it's a very useful thing if you want to iterate over numbers. It counts a sequence of numbers from start to n minus 1. And there's a reason why it is n minus 1, but I don't want to get into that just yet. In order to stick something into a list that already exists, you just use the append, append method. So you say list variable dot append whatever object you want to stick in there, and that will append an object to the end of a list. So let's take these three or functions, or actually two functions and one method, and see how it works. What we want to do is create a list of characters from A to Z. So first of all, we look up the character of A is 65. And the character of Z is 90. So using an iterative loop, we say for I in range of 65 to 91. Remember, we have to go to N minus 1. So that's the reason why we're going to 91. And we're just going to say print I. And this is an optional argument in the print statement. Normally, print after it prints something, it gives you a carriage return. But this time, we want to just use a comma so it's going to stick it all on one line and we hit enter we hit enter again which tells Python we're done with this loop and we see 65 66 67 okay so that shows you how to generate a sequence of numbers in Python using the range function so this time we're going to do the same sort of thing but we're going to, instead of print i, we're going to print the character of i. And you can see, when we hit enter this time, we get a, b, c, all the way through z. So now let's take advantage of this, and we're going to create an empty list. We're going to call it alpha. And we're going to append a into alpha. And we call alpha, and you can see, indeed, it has an a in there. And you can say uh, alpha append b. And so now alpha has A and B. So we're going to clear our list. And then we're going to do for I in range of 65 to 91 colon. And we're going to say alpha append the character of I. And we hit enter twice. And we look at alpha. And sure enough, we have what we want, a list of all the letters from A to Z. But notice, now let's do it on one line. Beta equals bracket character of i for i in range 
65 to 91, close bracket. And beta is exactly the same as alpha, except for instead of having three lines, we can do it in one. So you can see list comprehensions are extremely useful. So our two line loop is going to be replaced with one line you see there, terms equals bracket filter term of term for term and A, B, C, and D. And then you have to have two brackets there. The first bracket closes the list. The second one closes the list comprehension. So now we have all our terms in a list, but we need to add them up. Well, we could just say A plus B plus C, but we've got them in a list. Python has a built-in function, sum, that will do this. So all we have to do is say sum of terms. So here is our final version of our application. You can see we replace that two lines with our single list comprehension. And then we have our rating using the sum function. And then we're going to return rating rounded to the nearest tenth. And we're going to test it again. And you can see that our new function works as we expected. Whenever you take advantage of Python and code, it is said to be Pythonic. And this would be an example of a nice piece of code that is Pythonic. So for our next step, we're going to design a GUI for our function. And uh, we'll do that in the next slideshow. And once again, we're going to use TKEntertoy for our GUI design. If you live in or near southern Indiana or Louisville, Kentucky, I teach two-hour free seminars at both the Jeffersonville and the new Albany Public Libraries. So if you're interested in going through these slides with me personally helping you out, just go online or just call to reserve your spot. Thank you for listening, and if you're enjoying these slideshows, be sure to describe. And if you have friends that want to learn about Python, tell them too. Until the next time, happy coding.